This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the stone was Mazarin, the carbuncle was blue, and the mane was lion, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about what kind of chemistry experiments Sherlock Holmes was running? Or what a Yegman is? Or why Holmes' index was sorted haphazardly? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 212, Langer. Well, hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we talk about some of the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you languishing over there? I'm just monkeying around, actually. <laughs> well, I, I've got a few peanuts for you, but other than that, I, I can't help out. Uh, peanuts! Peanuts! We work for peanuts here at uh, Trifles. Well, that reminds me, if you would like the show notes for this episode, you can find them at iHose.co slash Trifles212. That's all lowercase. That'll take you to our website, Sherlock Holmes Podcast. Dot com specifically to this episode where you can find links and notes and other things related to what we're talking about. Uh, it's also an opportunity to hit that become a patron button. Uh, we have a number of patrons who are uh, supporting us for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, we have a whole slew of things on our Patreon page that uh, tell you the benefits that you get. And in, new and improved this year, we just launched our Discord channel. We're bringing people in there and it's going to act as kind of a, a community center for Trifles fans, supporters of the show, who wish to give us feedback, suggest topics for the show, and chat with each other. So if you are so inclined, uh, help support the show and become a member of our Discord community. We welcome that. And now, on with the show. Well, we said we weren't going to monkey around here. This this is the first in a series of episodes we are doing in 2021. Uh, it will be a limited series. will not run throughout the entire year. But the third week of every month, we will be talking about exotic animals in the canon. So we're not talking about, you know, the uh, the hounds or the, the cats that we may come across. We're talking about different and unique and exotic animals. And we thought, what a better way to kick off 2021 than with a little cocktail of sorts. Uh, the monkey gland cocktail being one of my favorites, Bert. Um, where do we come across Langer in the canon? This is The Adventure of the Creeping Man. And it's a wonderful story because it touches on one of the great obsessions of mankind – and also one of the particular interests of Victorian science, which was rejuvenation and or the fountain of youth. And, um, you know, when it proves impossible to find the fountain of youth, man does the next best thing. He attempts to uncover that secret through science. And that's what the mysterious and besieged Professor Presbury appears to be pursuing. Hmm. Yes, and he's pursuing that because he is uh, widowed. Uh, he has a daughter who is, oh gosh, somewhere in the, I want to say the 18 to 22 range. She's a young woman. Uh, and he falls in love with uh, the daughter of another professor um, at the college. He teaches at uh, Camford University, um, the appropriately disguised Cambridge and Oxford. You make the choice. We're not going to go into that debate here on this show uh, because we're talking specifically about uh, exotic animals. And we find that the professor is, well, engaging in some odd behavior. 
Uh, he, he is, uh, creeping around at night, hence the title of this story, The Creeping Man. Uh, he's climbing up trees, up the ivy on the sides of the building, uh, really making a monkey out of himself, uh, of, to impress his fiance. Uh, and th- this was, you know, as you said, this is part of his desire to uh, kind of recapture some of that youthful vigor that we um, that we lose as we age. Every, everyone does. And, and whether we are vain in our appearance, uh, and, uh, look to, uh, yeah, just kind of, uh, gussy ourselves up, tighten some of those lines, get rid of some of those wrinkles, or whether we wish to act more spry and sprightly, uh, and retain that spring in our step. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we see humans wanting to retain or reclaim. And that is exactly what uh, Professor Presbury did. Now, Professor Presbury was a professor of, I believe, anatomy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we talked uh, about uh, the three professors in uh, the last episode, so I should <laughs> I should be fresh in my mind on uh, Professor Presbury's uh, academic credentials. Um, but I believe that was, that was his area of responsibility. Um, so if Professor Presbury wished to kind of retain his or regain his youthful, um, his youthful energy, this wasn't something that he was going to cook up in, in a lab, uh, something that he could do in his off time. He needed help. So, uh, he, he, um, he did what anyone of the time would do. He went to a mail order program. Uh, <laughs> the the Amazon of the time. Uh, and so how did he get uh, some kind of concoction that would help him become more youthful and vigorous? Well, he goes on a trip. I mean, the interesting thing about this is that the start of it, you know, you get a, a number of lovely little things. You know, for example, um, you're absolutely right. Presbury is 61 years old, I think, in the in the story, in the case, and he's recently become engaged to a much younger woman. And shortly after the engagement, he disappears for two weeks. And when he returns, he comes back looking rather travel worn, and his behavior begins to change, and he becomes furtive and sly. And his dog attacks him, uh, with the incidents being nine days apart. And then he's getting strange things in the mail and he's not going to allow anyone to touch the mail that arrives marked by a cross under the stamp. Mm -hmm. And so um, Holmes, I think, is approached by uh, Trevor because what's happened here is that Trevor makes the mistake of touching a box that the professor brought back from his trip and all this secrecy and the big changes in the professor's behavior, uh, you know, sort of suggest that um, the professor is ingesting some sort of drug. And what it is or what it isn't is what really engages Sherlock Holmes. And, and the strange manner in which the professor is carrying on at night um, also seems to defy logical explanation. So the lovely thing is you have all of these uh, – um, you know, things that go into suggest that creating the, the mystery, the sense of menace, the peculiarity of this strange thing, particularly the dog, you know, dogs feature prominently in the cases of Sherlock Holmes. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that Holmes really, um, responds to. Good old Roy the Wolfhound, um, yeah. which this, this actually, uh, kind of feeds into that. Um, you know, long-standing myth. I, I don't know if uh, how, how true it is or not of uh, how dogs and uh, monkeys don't get along. Um, can't say I've experienced oh. any of that. We haven't brought a monkey around the house here to test that. Although our dog will bark at anything. As, as listeners have probably heard, uh, if if some of those uh, barks have slipped through my editing prowess. Um, but let's uh, let's investigate uh, exactly what. Uh, this serum was right after this quick word. With each passing season brings another passing quarterly issue of the Baker Street Journal. 
This scholarly journal has been around since 1946, and each year produces four volumes, one for each season, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, and a bonus Christmas annual. That's right, that's five issues every year of the Baker Street Journal, which consists of some of the best Sherlockian scholarship around the world. In each issue, you can read authors, people like yourself from all around the world and all around the Sherlockian societies, who write in with their theories on Dr. Watson's bullpup, Sherlock Holmes' proficiency on the violin, the appearance of Mycroft Holmes and Mrs. Hudson, and more. If you can imagine something interesting to write about in the Sherlock Holmes stories, then someone probably will in the Baker Street Journal. Are you subscribed? Get over to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and make sure you are part of the BSJ tradition today. We are back. We're talking about the Langer and specifically Serum of Langer, which actually I, I wanted to remark on this before. Uh, this is in the spirit of a colleague of Conan Doyle's, Robert Louis Stevenson, who, of course, in 1886 wrote The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I, I want to uh, be careful about this because uh, and I'm, I'm kind of testing my memory here because it's been a while since I've read the book, but I, I was initially going to say that, um, Jekyll had ingested the serum, not to regain his youthful vigor, um, but simply to allow himself to experience vices under a, uh, a, a different guise. Uh, am I, am I correct in remembering that? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it sounds plausible to me, but I don't remember. It's been a long time since I read Jekyll and Hyde, and I don't remember the motivations behind Henry Jekyll, although I think he was also – my memory is, and so it's completely useless. My memory is that uh, – and highly suspect. My memory is that Henry Jekyll had, had also a higher goal that he wanted to – to isolate and there and thereby remove evil, I think. But I could be completely wrong. Hmm. Well, he, I guess the point is he wasn't, uh, an older man, uh, trying to seek youth. Uh, no, like, no, no. uh, like Professor Presbury here. So, um, so what, what happens in the story is, uh, Holmes discovers some correspondence with, um, uh, Gosh, he said there was uh, an empty vial, uh, a hypodermic syringe, several letters, and a crabbed foreign hand. Uh, <laughs> the marks on the envelope showed that they were uh, from um, uh, dated from the Commercial Road and signed A. Dorak. Mm. They were invoices to say that a fresh bottle was being sent to Professor Presbury or uh, receipts to acknowledge money. And then there was a more educated hand bearing the Austrian stamp. With the postmark of Prague. And Holmes said, here we have our material. And, and the letter said, honored colleague, since your esteemed visit, I've thought much of your case. And though in your circumstances, there are some special reasons for the treatment, I would nonetheless enjoin caution. And my, as my results have shown that it is not without danger of a kind. It is possible that the serum of anthropoid would have been better. I have, as I explained to you, used black-faced languor because a specimen was accessible. Languor is, of course, a crawler and a climber, while anthropoid walks erect and is in all ways nearer. I beg you to take every possible precaution that there be no premature revelation of the process. I have one other client in England, and Dorak is my agent for both. Weekly, uh, weekly reports will oblige. Yours with highest esteem, H. Lowenstein. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that letter, and uh, we have at our hands, at our disposal, the uh, Sherlock Holmes reference library from uh, Wessex Press, our fine sponsors over at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Um, what, what are some of the things we can note from that note, Bert? Well, um, the note 
sets off a lot of Holmes's investigation. And it's worth noting that there have already been some very strange, in addition to Trevor's observations about Presbury, there's a lot going on. Presbury has a daughter named Edith, and we never find out exactly how thrilled Edith is, I don't think, with the idea that the pres- that her father is about to marry someone who is likely younger than she is. Uh, but she awakes one night to see Presbury's face looking in at her, and her room is on the second floor from the outside. <laughs> so, um, you know, the professor would have to have this bizarre ability to be able to climb up the outside of a wall. And, and of course, you know, as you say, we get to this, this note from A. Dorak, and I always thought that was a great typo, that it was really Antonin Dvorak, who happened to be, before his musical career, happened to be, uh, and his career as a composer, um, you know, was involved in this. I'm sure there's a paper in that, in that somewhere, but, but, you know, again, you've got this sort of sequence of, of nine days passing and so on. And Holmes figures out that the cy- cycle is repeating. And, you know, we know that the professor's knuckles are thick and horny in a way, which is quite new in my experience, Holmes observes. And, um, you know, when we get to Lowenstein of Prague, there's been a lot of work around that, including work by our friends Al Silverstein and Jan Prager, who did a great study. In fact, Jan's investiture is Lowenstein of Prague, the most maligned man in the canon. And they, they identified Lowenstein, Lowenstein as Eugen Steinach, the scientist who coined the word hormone. Hmm. And although was, Steinach was maligned by the contemporary press, he was ultimately shown to be a great scientific pioneer. And, um, incidentally, they, you know how you make a hormone? You don't pay her. <laughs> oh dear. Sorry. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> and they argue that uh, that good old Steinock was somehow duped into uh, into doing this. But but hmm. you know here you have it. You know some again very interesting, isn't it? The the research on this. Now of course the Victorians got into a, a whole variety of these things: animal extracts, various serums, extractions. Mm-hmm experiments that were used to treat everything from constipation to uh, cholera. Um, but uh, interesting, isn't it, that the development of the serum isn't happening in Knightsbridge. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's not, you know, in Surrey someplace. It's in this mysterious far distant place where they speak a different language and it's got to get there by mail and there's one other client and there's a go-between you know, so there's no casting any calumny on the quality of scientific biomedical research in Britain for this. Well, yeah, I mean, this is this is the black market. What we're talking about here, this is not full scale production of Viagra um, or, <laughs> or 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 Cialis or some similar uh, drug that we see now that uh, enjoins uh, virility to uh, back to uh, the uh, the subject. Um, interesting here, though, in in the note. Uh, Lowenstein was uh, going back and forth between uh, serum of anthropoid or serum of langer. Mm. And uh, in anthropoid, uh, at least according to the Encyclopedia Sherlockiana, is uh, an ape, uh, the family of tailless man-like monkeys, uh, while the langer is, uh, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, one of the two Hindu names of the sacred Indian monkey, scientifically known as Semnopithecus entellus, a prodigiously long tail, beetling eyebrows with long black hairs, black ears, face, feet, and hands, and a general grayish-brown color of the fur. Those are the distinctive characteristics of the langur. So it's a very uh, long and skinny uh, monkey, um, and and uh, in terms of size, uh, they usually uh, the the head and body length is from fifty one to seventy nine centimeters, or twenty to thirty one inches. So they aren't very large. Versus, of course, the ape, which we know uh, is more humanoid in its likeness. And you know, you really have to wonder uh, with the uh, application of this serum. Uh, 
you know, if, okay, of course you're getting, you're getting vigor, you're getting vitality, but would you actually take on the behavioral characteristics of the animal in question? Um, you know, it, it, it seems, I mean, it, it's talking about, uh, Professor Presbury even getting some of the, um, uh, the physical characteristics, the knuckles and the, uh, you know, the hunched over, uh, kind of posture. It, it, it seems rather ludicrous. Uh, to that extent, that it wouldn't just be some sort of burst event. It wouldn't be like drinking the five hour energy drink. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's actually transforming him into, uh, the beast. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's indicative. Of, it's sort of the same level of inquiry that revolves around spiritualism. You know, Conan Doyle's insight was, that the the life, the world that we have is so beautiful. You know, it just can't end with a lifetime. It must continue. And it was sort of a sort of a fundamental uh, observation that he made that was, and I'm sure many people made that resulted in thinking about spiritualism. And in the same way, the idea is, you know, here's this animal. Look how vital, you know. And you use the word vitality as if that really was connected to youth. But look how elastic and muscular and energetic and fast. And look how old and fat and slow I am. Boy, surely if I had a food processor and I could put some anthropoids or monkeys in it and sort of extract a little. Of course, I have to do that outside of Britain because otherwise, you know, some of these countries will uh, not worry about me having to clean up after all of that. And I can probably do it in the Black Forest somewhere. I I could sort of inject a little bit of that into me. And next thing I know, I too will be hopping around and and thinking about going down to the greengrocer and inquiring about bananas. Dr. Walter's apothecary (laughs) and Langer smoothie. Uh, You know, I mean, it's... Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, pretty goofy. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, it, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that Langer would have been, uh, chosen and, and one has to wonder how Lowenstein, um, you know, the most maligned man in the canon would have gotten his hand on, uh, such creatures. Um, and kind of from the, um, uh, ripped from the headlines school of thought in in after the letter in uh, the crooked man uh, Holmes says Lowenstein the name brought back to me the memory of some snippet from a newspaper which spoke of an obscure scientist who was striving in some unknown way for the secret of rejuvenescence and the elixir of life <laughs> and and on that note the elixir of life um Al Roden and Jack Key uh, in their 1984 book, which I believe was right. uh, the medical case book of Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle, um, they note the work of French physiologist Brown Sicard around uh, 1890. Brown mm-hmm. Sicard injected himself with extracts of sex organs. Even though he felt more youthful as a result, he still died at his appointed time, as all men must. Controlled studies using water instead of extracts have also produced subjective feelings of improvement. Even in the decade when The Creeping Man was published, the 1920s, medical fatism and quackery included transplanted monkey glands as well as extracts for rejuvenation. Yes. Well, too, and in the notes, you know, that you mentioned earlier for the casebook of Sherlock Holmes by Les Klinger, there's also a report about old Brown Seacard, and apparently Brown Seacard reported in his lecture that he had just been married for the third time to a much younger woman, and after taking his injections, had been able to re-engage in sexual activity, which had also waned with the rest of his vigor. And the note here says this made quite a sensation in the Paris papers of June 1889. Why, I'm sure monkeys weren't safe on the street. And <laughs> <laughs> in Paris. Well, as much as Professor Presbury was uh, Edith's father, I'll be a monkey's uncle. <laughs> and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. 
Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Remember the gorilla is a social animal. And if you both mind your manners, you will do well enough, I dare say.